Well, it's Monday. Welcome to Collision Coffee Talk. We're going to get your week uh, started off as best as we can. We've got a few things to cover. There's some things I really want to cover. But I'm going to save that for a little bit later on in the week. Um, but we will get this going so that you can all start your week off right. All right. So this little article um, came out today. Um, a little bit more to it than just um, just a recall. So just for everybody out there, aftermarket parts are regularly recalled for safety issues. Um, and I know that this isn't explained a lot, specifically to adjusters, but a lot of times body shops as well, if you don't do some digging, but I, I didn't understand this as an adjuster. I was always told that aftermarket parts are good. They're warranted to at least the same as the original manufacturer. We'll stand behind them even longer. I mean, that was a big deal. I think in the 90s, we used to say, well, we give better uh, warranty on aftermarket parts than even the OEM does. But so you don't hear about these problems. Um, no one ever told me as an adjuster that there was a regular recall list of parts. Like, I didn't even know that was a thing. Um, I don't know if anyone out there can tell me the last time that they saw a part recall from an OEM. I remember some hoods from General Motors maybe 15, 20 years ago. But I mean, if you've got some more relevant or recent recalls from OEMs on crash parts, um, I would love to see it. But this is a it, it comes out as a public safety notice. And it basically tells you um, that the following part has been identified. This was a CAPA certified part. This was just not your regular uncertified aftermarket part has been determined to pose a potential safety hazard. So that doesn't mean primers releasing, it's corroding or whatever. This is a potential safety hazard. So this is a Subaru 2019 to 2021. This is a hood. The potential hazard, the striker and hinge mounting weldments may not function properly as intended. Um, yeah, that means when you're driving down the road, that stuff releases and the hood goes flying into the windshield, up over the car, into the car behind them, you know, whatever. Um, and so that's that they're no longer part of the program. I want you to pay attention to the bottom there. Well, it says, well, what do we do, right? Installers of the part. Who is that? That's not, it doesn't say the insurer that wrote this part on their estimate. It says the installer of the part, which is you as the body shop, need to contact the distributor who sold it to you to figure out what the fix for that is going to be. Um, and so that's, I always, I, you know, you can, you can, if you don't want to believe me, you can go to Repair Driven News and I think you can actually search Subaru and like 2015 aftermarket parts. And this happened before on a reinforcement um, and there was a, a great kind of like a series of articles done and the insurers were asked point blank, all the insurers were asked, um, who's responsible for these parts. And you can read a letter written by nationwide insurance sent back to repair driven news that basically says we write estimates for indemnification purposes only, which that means is that we're not determining how the car gets fixed. We're going to determine what we're going to pay for the damages, Right. Including those parts on our estimate does not mean that the body shop was supposed to order those or use those. You're the clothes and repair professional. That is the same sentiment for DRP. So don't think that, well, I'm a DRP, so it's different. They were just talking about independent body shops. That's your choice as the body shop to install those parts because the customer has instructed you to, right? You don't get to just make that decision on your own, but the customer's instructed you to. I totally get it but you are legally liable for those parts. And then what is the longevity or what is the, the, the duty owed to ensure that that part is never recalled? And so these recalls are frequent. If you're, if you're not going to do them, which I mean, I don't know how you would, right? There were several programs invented. Keyless, I always talk about Keyless. It was one of those ones before I left the insurance industry that LKQ and everybody was working on, which it was the system was designed because insurers wanted collision repair shops to understand they were legally liable for the parts so they wanted you to have a way where you recorded it by by claim number and part, you know, cap sticker number um, so that we could be aware of where all these parts were so that you could take responsibility for installing them. We were never going to do that. I don't know where that, where that came from. But um, but if you're not going to do all that and keep a spreadsheet and keep track of all that or whatever, I get it. You've got a lot on your plate. But you at least need to advise the customer that there are potential issues with these parts. They are potential public safety notices, right? There's a potential safety hazard as clearly listed in this thing um, and that they need to track it and they can, right? They can go in if you give them the little part numbers. There's a Kappa tracker, right? You can go in there and type in your little part number and it'll pop back and tell you if there's been any issues with that part. Um, but if you don't do that, then technically 
you installed it. So it's kind of like, it's on you to be the one that, that, that does that. Um, I get asked all the time um, about this. We do this um, and I keep track of this because of for court situations, like if we're going to go um, and argue why an alternative part was not the right indemnification for the customer. This is this this reporting is one of the things that I always kind of bring out. So how do you get there? Well, this is just one printed notice. And I tell you that there's parts all the time. Um, what was interesting about this one that I think it warranted a little extra attention is that this particular manufacturer is not a good actor, right? They're not a good player. There's not a lot of character and integrity. They were caught a few years ago. Basically, they had developed the part. They had sent that part through for testing and certification, manufactured one particular way with one particular material. Um, and then after they got the certification, well, to save money, they started manufacturing that part with a completely different material. Now they got caught, right? And because they got caught, back then we had two players in the marketplace on certifying aftermarket parts. NFS completely cut that manufacturer from the program whatsoever. Um, it... it I'm not a fan of aftermarket parts because of my history with them in the insurance industry, not because of anything else. Um, but, but I gave NFS credit. Like I, I don't like them. I'm never, I'm typically pretty hard on the companies that, that do aftermarket parts, distribute them, sell them, manufacture them, et cetera. Um, but I gave them a lot of credit for being the ones that just say, Hey, they're done. They're, I'm, we're revoking all of their parts, all of their certifications. We're not having them on the program. Yeah. But Kappa didn't. So Kappa has kept them on and still continues to list their parts and sort of other parts. Um, kudos, Repair Driven News did ask them for a statement. Why are you, do you continue to allow these people to be in your program? I think we know the answer to that. I don't think we really need a formal response from them, although, you know, it is kind of cute that the, the industry, you know, will occasionally do that. So um, what does this look like for you? Well, I want to change here real quick, and I'm going to put you guys on to my email so we'll share the screen all right awesome. yeah what you do let me get in here and find what i want you guys to see sweet all right uh, i'm going to walk you through how you sign up for these um these emails to, so that you're aware of, of what's out there so okay here we go all right if you want to sign up and get aware, you can get a weekly email or you can get a monthly email. That's how frequently these parts are decertified, right? You can get them weekly or monthly. I prefer monthly because I don't like to just chew up my entry. Um, they'll, they'll, emails will come to you. Be very careful. Sometimes they will fall in like your, um, uh, your spam folder. So you can see up here, it says subscribe, unsubscribe. So if you're using like Google email or whatever, it'll it'll push some things, but you'll get it here and you can download the part, the, the report, you can um, look to it. How do you do that? Well, you go into here, this is uh, the CAPA website. So this is their homepage, CAPACertified.org. You go all the way to the bottom and right here where it says CAPA certified parts update, you can click that. Enter your information, decide which of these four that you want. I only want to see the certified parts report, decertified parts report. You can get a monthly update and it'll tell you parts that have been added as well as parts that have been taken away. So you can see both of them if you want to. I don't need to see the parts added. That's just been my personal preference, but whatever you want to do. You can also sign up for Kappa News if you want to hit register. Um, you may have to validate your email. You may need to make sure that you do something so that it doesn't end up your spam folder and that you can see it. Um, but when you do download it, this is what it will look like. So this is October 2024's decertification report. Um, and it shows that I've got um, some offender, three hoods, um, a Silverado, a couple of Hyundai parts, Kia. Um, in plastics, we've got Mazda, Nissan, Toyota, Volkswagen, Volvo, Ford, and Chevrolet. So a bunch of bumper covers and some grills that have been decertified. Um, notice that Tan Yang name there. Um, I go to shops and I see a lot of Tan Yang parts. Right, specifically when I'm dealing with the DRP driven repair facilities. I mean, that brand name is everywhere, right? I see that brand more than I see your own brand in your own shops. So um, just um, be aware, it's not just off, off manufacturers. It's the one that you guys are frequently um, ordering from. If you come down here and we look at lighting, we see TYC and Depot, both have recalls on there. Again, those are really prevalent. Um, manufacturers of headlamps that we see that shops are installing because the insurance company puts on the estimate and you guys think you got to go do this. Um, here's my headlight warning, right? Like you can do an aftermarket fender and maybe it just is ugly. It doesn't fit right or whatever. 
Um, but when it comes to headlights, they're they're an extreme safety issue. It's not just about can you bright, can you can you light up the night? Can you light up a roadway? Um, when we used to think about headlights, it was just like can you see right? Are they bright enough to see? But nowadays, with forward facing cameras and ADAS systems, um, the ability for that camera to see at night is is how the ADAS system works. Well, if that algorithm is written for a certain distance. And based on the speed, so if the car is going 50 miles an hour, it needs to see X. If the car is going 30 miles an hour, it needs to see Y. Like that, then that the headlight has to be a certain number of lumens, right? You've got to have a certain pattern. You've got to have a certain distance. I mean, there's all these science things and all this math that's in it. Um, and if the headlight isn't bright enough um, and it doesn't go far enough, then that system is going to maybe it's claims mitigation or collision mitigation braking. Maybe it's uh, lane departure warning, but whatever that is. If it if it reacts too slowly, then it doesn't do its job and it may not do its job because we put in an aftermarket headlight. Um, and I'll tell you that 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 particular spill I just gave is not because I'm super, some super bright collision person. It's because it's it's currently come up in a lawsuit. Right. Like, did the vehicle was it able to do what it needed to do because the previous repair had involved two aftermarket headlamps. So um, there's some, there's a lot of math and science and all of that. You need to be sure that you're really thinking about what you're doing. If you are going to do it, then what conversations and what disclosures do you need to have with the customers? That's your responsibility as the collision repair center. You are considered the repair expert. I hate using that terminology, um, but it's not just a matter of throwing the parts on the car and going, well, it's not my fault. That's their policy. They should have read it differently. If they didn't want to use aftermarket parts, they should have. We do a lot of deflection in this industry, and we put a lot of stuff back on the plate of the, cons the consumer or the insurer, and we like to say it's not my fault, um, but we're the one turning the wrenches on the car. So um, making sure you have a disclosure plan, making sure you're pulling these, dis these um, decertification reports on a regular basis. Um, that you have and that you discuss it as a company. You may want to go discuss it with your business attorney and, and have a conversation with them. Um, and sometimes I like to, when I'm having a conversation with a customer about, do you want to pay out of pocket so that you get OEM parts? This is sometimes the information I put across the table and go, here's why. And here's and here's what our concern is. And, you know, if you're going to keep this vehicle and, and, and do some different things, why I think you should, you know, maybe consider something else. Um, when it comes to um, your safety or whatever. So just remember um, in the eyes of the insurer, you are responsible because you installed the part. There's a reason they write those parts. If they thought they were gonna be legally liable for them, there would be no way any insurer in the entire United States would write them. They know they're not because it's an indemnification document that they're doing, not a repair document. So they know that that lies completely on you. Which brings us to the next thing. Um, I get, I get asked all the time, how do you approach a customer about paying out of pocket? What do you do when the insurer won't pay your estimate? And so I kind of always like to explain it really based on the discussion we just had before. So I always, people always ask me about a supplement as a body shop. I need you to keep in mind that a supplement is not you asking for how you want to have the car repaired, right? The customer chose you as their collision center. But even on a DRP, you were chosen to be the collision center. You do not work for the insurer. They are not your client. They are not your customer. I am a former DRP director and I have said it corporate and I am telling you at no time is the insurer your customer. We have a mutual beneficial relationship, right? You guys are going to process claims for the insurer and that's going to let things go faster and they don't have to have as much staff and whatever. But you don't work for each other. You have independent goals and you have independent things that you need to accomplish. But when when I write a repair plan, that repair plan is presented back to the customer. The customer selects how they want to have a car repaired. They, they came to you. They get to make those decisions. You can explain and walk them through things, but the customer needs to decide how they want their car fixed. Then that estimate is sent up to a bill payer. That's all the insurer is, is a bill payer. It's like, I have estimated the amount of this loss to be X, and Ms. Smith is requesting X be paid to her. When an insurer makes changes to an estimate, um, or they write something, a different indemnification document in which they base payment on, right? And so I've seen that a lot lately where insurers send out letters that say, payment will only be based on our estimate of appraisal of damage. And I'm like, you probably don't want to put that in writing, but thanks for that. That makes me really super happy. But they're not telling you how to fix the car. They're basically saying, here's what we're willing to pay. 
too many shops get it caught up in this. I can't fix a car that way. That's not proper. That doesn't follow the OE procedures or whatever. But that's not what the insurer is saying. The insurer is coming back and saying, this is all we're willing to pay for this amount of this loss. You have to go back to Ms. Smith. They didn't deny you. They denied her. She picked the repair plan. She wanted her car fixed this way. You sent it up. They're telling her they're not paying for that. So if you wrote it for 12 and they only want to pay 10, Ms. Smith has a $2,000 deficit. You don't. And how you present that to the customer is critical, right? Like your ability to make them understand that they have a role to advocate for themselves, that they get to determine how their car is repaired, that they get to make these decisions and that they have to be the one that seeks the indemnification because technically the customer is who owes you. An insurer never owes you, even in a DRP, right? That's why we still have to get directions to pay and authorizations or repair signed in the DRP program. There's, there's no relationship, right? I, I don't know any other way to say this or make that any, any clearer for people to understand. Um, so just make sure that you're positioning it that way, that you start having those conversations with clients and that you start looking at it that way. If, you, if you're not looking at it as a, they don't know how to fix a car and these adjusters can't change a black tire or whatever, they've got a job to do. Their job is to determine indemnification of a policy. So how much of that policy is going to pay out for this loss? Your job is to figure out how to repair the car safely and accurately and what that's going to cost so that you make a profit so that your business stays open. You guys have two different jobs. Um, so just make sure that you are um, um, aware of that as you go through. I think if, if shops can start changing their perspective and start changing how they have conversations with, with the customers, this will get a little less friction and there'll be a little bit better conversation because I, most of the fresh friction that I run into right now is, is, is a shop being extremely frustrated that the insurer doesn't see things the same way they see them. And we think that it's a lack of knowledge or we think it's intentional because they just don't want to pay what it takes to repair the car. But you do in fact have two different jobs and, and it's, I always, I always say it's not our circus, not our monkey, right? Cause we want to get paid, but, but in the long run, it's the customer that decides how their car is going to get repa repaired. Not my job, right? I always go back to saying, hey, at West Coast Customs, we put a fish tank and a steering wheel one time, right? A customer can have anything done. The, the Carolina squat is, a, is an example. A customer can do anything stupid to their car that they want to do. They own it. It's their property. Um, but, but we get to decide what our compensation and what we're willing to do is. And it's that customer's job to get the compensation, not ours. So shops get out of the middle of that. Um, I know as an insurer, if a shop's in the middle of it, I have a lot more power. It's very easy for me to manipulate and work with a shop because I don't have as many rules around how I have to behave in that area than, than how I have to treat a customer. So activating your customer um, is not a bad thing. It's not a failure. It's not your job to take the keys from them and go off and be the soldier that fights for every penny on a repair. Um, it's It's your job to inform them, educate them, work with them, let them understand, let them make the selections of what they want and then and then go forward that way.